Preface of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Prefatory Material. Preface. Seventeen years ago, the author of this work made his first trip abroad to gather material for a book on coffee. Subsequently, he spent a year in travel among the coffee-producing countries. After the initial surveys, correspondents were appointed to make researches in the principal European libraries and museums, and this phase of the work continued until April 1922. Simultaneous researches were conducted in American libraries and historical museums up to the time of the return of the final proofs to the printer in June 1922. Ten years ago, the sorting and classification of the material was begun. The actual writing of the manuscript has extended over four years. Among the unique features of the book are the Coffee Thesaurus, the Coffee Chronology, containing 492 dates of historical importance, the complete reference table of the principal kinds of coffee grown in the world, and the coffee bibliography, containing 1,380 references. The most authoritative works on this subject have been Robinson's The Early History of Coffee Houses in England, published in London in 1893, and Jardin's Le Café, published in Paris in 1895. The author wishes to acknowledge his indebtedness to both for inspiration and guidance. Other works, Arabian, French, English, German, and Italian, dealing with particular phases of the subject, have been laid under contribution, and where this has been done, credit is given by footnote reference. In all cases where it has been possible to do so, however, statements of historical facts have been verified by independent research. Not a few items have required months of tracing to confirm or to disprove. There has been no serious American work on coffee since Hewitt's Coffee, its history, cultivation, and uses, published in 1872, and Thurber's Coffee from Plantation to Cup, published in 1881. Both of these are now out of print, as is also Walsh's Coffee, its history, classification, and description, published in 1893. The chapters on the chemistry of coffee and the pharmacology of coffee have been prepared under the author's direction by Charles W. Trigg, Industrial Fellow of the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research. The author wishes to acknowledge, with thanks, valuable assistance and numerous courtesies by the officials of the following institutions. British Museum and Guildhall Museum, London, Bibliothèque Nationale, Paris, Congressional Library, Washington, New York Public Library, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and New York Historical Society, New York, Boston Public Library, and Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Smithsonian Institution, Washington, State Historical Museum, Madison, Wisconsin, Maine Historical Society, Portland, Chicago Historical Society, New Jersey Historical Society, Newark, Harvard University Library, Essex Institute, Salem, Massachusetts, Peabody Institute, Baltimore. Thanks and appreciation are due also to Charles James Jackson, London, for permission to quote from his illustrated history of English plate. Francis Hill Bigelow, author, and the Macmillan Company, publishers, for permission to reproduce illustrations from Historic Silver of the Colonies. H.G. Dwight, author, and Charles Scribner's Sons, publishers, for permission to quote from Constantinople, Old and New, and from the article on Turkish coffee houses in Scribner's Magazine. Walter G. Peter, Washington, D.C., for permission to photograph and reproduce pictures of articles in the Peter Collection at the United States National Museum. Mary P. Hamlin and George Arliss, authors, and George C. Tyler, producer, for permission to reproduce the exchange coffeehouse setting of the first act of Hamilton. Judge A. T. Clearwater, Kingston, New York, 
R. T. Haynes Halsey and Francis P. Garvin, New York, for permission to publish pictures of historic silver coffee pots in their several collections. The secretaries of the American Chambers of Commerce in London, Paris, and Berlin. Charles Cooper, London, for his splendid cooperation and for a special contribution to Chapter 35. Alonzo H. de Graff, London, for his invaluable aid and unflagging zeal in directing the London researches. To the Coffee Trade Association, London, for assistance rendered. To G. J. Lethem, London, for his translations from the Arabic. Jeffrey Sefton, Vienna, for his nice cooperation. L. P. Debussy of the Colonial Institute, Amsterdam, Holland, for assistance rendered. Burton Holmes and Blendon R. Campbell of New York for courtesies. John Cotton Dana, Newark, New Jersey, for assistance rendered. Charles H. Barnes, Medford, Massachusetts, for permission to publish the photograph of Peregrine White's Mayflower Mortar and Pestle. Andrew L. Winton, Ph.D., Wilton, Connecticut, for permission to quote from his The Microscopy of Vegetable Foods in the chapter on the microscopy of coffee and to reprint Professor J. Moeller's and T-shirts and Osterley's drawings. F. Holton Frankel, Ph.D., Edward M. Frankel, Ph.D., and Arno V. Hoever for their assistance in preparing the chapters on the botany of coffee and the microscopy of coffee. A. L. Burns, New York, for his assistance in the correction and revision of chapters 25, 26, 27, and 34, and for much historical information supplied in connection with chapters 30 and 31. Edward Aborn, New York, for his help in the revision of chapter 36. George W. Lawrence, former president, and T. S. B. Nielsen, president of the New York Coffee and Sugar Exchange, for their assistance in the revision of chapter 31. Helio Lobo, Brazilian Consul General, New York, Sebastião Sampaio, Commercial Attaché of the Brazilian Embassy, Washington, and T. H. Langard de Menezes, American Representative of the Sociedad Promotoro de Defensa do Café. Felix Costa, Secretary and Manager, the National Coffee Roasters Association, and C. B. Stroud, Superintendent, the New York Coffee and Sugar Exchange, for information supplied and assistance rendered in the revision of several chapters. F. T. Holmes, New York, for his help in the compilation of chronological and descriptive data on coffee roasting machinery. Walter Chester, New York, for critical comments on Chapter 28. The author is especially indebted to the following, who in many ways have contributed to the successful compilation of the complete reference table in Chapter 24, and of those chapters having to do with the early history and development of the green coffee and the wholesale coffee roasting trades in the United States. George S. Wright, Boston, A. E. Forbes, William Fisher, Gwynne Evans, Jerome J. Shotton, and the late Julius J. Shotton, St. Louis. James H. Taylor, William Bain, Jr., A. J. Danamiller, B. A. Liverato, S. A. Schoenbrunn, Herbert Wilde, A. C. Fitzpatrick, Charles Meehan, Clarence Creighton, Abram Wakeman, A. H. Davies, Joshua Walker, Fred P. Gordon, Alex H. Purcell, George W. Vanderhoef, Colonel William P. Room, W. Lee Simmons, Herman Simmons, W. H. Aborn, B. Leahy, John C. Loudon, J. R. Westfall, Abraham Reamer, R. C. Wilhelm, C. H. Stewart, and the late August Haisler, New York. John D. Warfield, Ezra J. Warner, S. O. Blair, and George D. McLaughlin, Chicago. W. H. Harrison, James Heakin, and Charles Lewis, Cincinnati. Albro Blodgett and A. M. Wilson, Toledo. R. V. Engelhard and Lee G. Zinsmeister, Louisville. E. A. Call, San Francisco. S. Jackson, New Orleans. Louis Sherman, Milwaukee. Howard F. Boardman, Hartford. 
a h devers portland oregon w james mayhood pittsburgh william b harris east orange new jersey new york june seventeenth nineteen twenty two forward some introductory remarks on the lore of coffee its place in a rational dietary its universal psychological appeal its use and abuse civilization in its onward march has produced only three important non-alcoholic beverages the extract of the tea plant the extract of the cocoa bean and the extract of the coffee bean leaves and beans these are the vegetable sources of the world's favorite non-alcoholic table beverages of the two the tea leaves lead in total amount consumed the coffee beans are second and the cocoa beans are a distant third although advancing steadily but in international commerce the coffee beans occupy a far more important position than either of the others being imported into non-producing countries to twice the extent of the tea leaves all three enjoy a worldwide consumption although not to the same extent in every nation but where either the coffee bean or the tea leaf has established itself in a given country the other gets comparatively little attention and usually has great difficulty in making any advance the cocoa bean on the other hand has not risen to the position of popular favorite in any important consuming country and so has not aroused the serious opposition of its two rivals coffee is universal in its appeal all nations do it homage it has become recognized as a human necessity it is no longer a luxury or an indulgence it is a corollary of human energy and human efficiency people love coffee because of its twofold effect the pleasurable sensation and the increased efficiency it produces coffee has an important place in the rational dietary of all the civilized peoples of earth it is a democratic beverage not only is it the drink of fashionable society but it is also a favorite beverage of the men and women who do the world's work whether they toil with brain or brawn it has been acclaimed the most grateful lubricant known to the human machine and the most delightful taste in all nature no food drink has ever encountered so much opposition as coffee given to the world by the church and dignified by the medical profession nevertheless it has had to suffer from religious superstition and medical prejudice during the thousand years of its development it has experienced fierce political opposition stupid fiscal restrictions unjust taxes irksome duties but surviving all of these it has triumphantly moved on to a foremost place in the catalogue of popular beverages but coffee is something more than a beverage it is one of the world's greatest adjuvant foods there are other auxiliary foods but none that excels it for palatability and comforting effects the psychology of which is to be found in its unique flavor and aroma men and women drink coffee because it adds to their sense of well-being it not only smells good and tastes good to all mankind heathen or civilized but all respond to its wonderful stimulating properties the chief factors in coffee goodness are the caffeine content and the caffeol caffeine supplies the principal stimulant it increases the capacity for muscular and mental work without harmful reaction the caffeol supplies the flavor and the aroma that indescribable oriental fragrance that woos us through the nostrils forming one of the principal elements that make up the lure of coffee there are several other constituents including certain innocuous so-called caffeinic acids that in combination with the caffeol give the beverage its rare gustatory appeal the year 1919 awarded coffee one of its brightest honors an american general said that coffee shared with bread and bacon the distinction of being one of the three nutritive essentials that helped win the world war for the allies so this symbol of human brotherhood has played a not inconspicuous part in making the world safe for democracy the new age ushered in by the peace of versailles and the washington conference has for its handmaidens temperance and self-control 
It is to be a world democracy of right living and clear thinking, and among its most precious adjuncts are coffee, tea, and cocoa, because these beverages must always be associated with rational living, with greater comfort, and with better cheer. Like all good things in life, the drinking of coffee may be abused. Indeed, those having an idiosyncratic susceptibility to alkaloids should be temperate in the use of tea, coffee, or cocoa. In every high-tension country, there is likely to be a small number of people who, because of certain individual characteristics, cannot drink coffee at all. These belong to the abnormal minority of the human family. Some people cannot eat strawberries, but that would not be a valid reason for a general condemnation of strawberries. One may be poisoned, says Thomas A. Edison, from too much food. Horace Fletcher was certain that overfeeding causes all our ills. Overindulgence in meat is likely to spell trouble for the strongest of us. Coffee is perhaps less often abused than wrongly accused. It all depends a little more tolerance. Trading upon the credulity of the hypochondriac and the caffeine sensitive, in recent years there has appeared in America and abroad a curious collection of so-called coffee substitutes. They are neither fish nor flesh nor good red herring. Most of them have been shown by official government analyses to be sadly deficient in food value, their only alleged virtue. One of our contemporary attackers of the national beverage bewails the fact that no palatable hot drink has been found to take the place of coffee. The reason is not hard to find. There can be no substitute for coffee. Dr. Harvey W. Wiley has ably summed up the matter by saying, a substitute should be able to perform the functions of its principle. A substitute to war must be able to fight. A bounty jumper is not a substitute. It has been the aim of the author to tell the whole coffee story for the general reader, yet with the technical accuracy that will make it valuable to the trade. The book is designed to be a work of useful reference covering all the salient points of coffee's origin, cultivation, preparation, and development, its place in the world's commerce and in a rational dietary. Good coffee, carefully roasted and properly brewed, produces a natural beverage that, for tonic effect, cannot be surpassed even by its rivals, tea and cocoa. Here is a drink that 97% of individuals find harmless and wholesome, and without which life would be drab indeed. A pure, safe, and helpful stimulant compounded in nature's own laboratory and one of the chief joys of life. A coffee thesaurus. Encomiums and descriptive phrases apply to the plant, the berry, and the beverage. The plant. The precious plant, this friendly plant, mocha's happy tree, the gift of heaven, the plant with the jessamine-like flowers, the most exquisite perfume of Araby, the blessed, given to the human race by the gift of the gods. The berry. The magic bean, the divine fruit, fragrant berries, rich royal berry, voluptuous berry, the precious berry, the healthful bean, the heavenly berry, the marvelous berry, this all-healing berry, Yemen's fragrant berry, the little aromatic berry, little brown Arabian berry, thought-inspiring bean of Arabia, the smoking ardent beans Aleppo sends, that wild fruit which gives so beloved a drink. The beverage. Nepenthe festive cup, juice divine, nectar divine, ruddy mocha, a man's drink, lovable liquor, delicious mocha, the magic drink, this rich cordial, its stream divine, the family drink, the festive drink, coffee is our gold, nectar of all men, the golden mocha, this sweet nectar, celestial ambrosia, the friendly drink, the cheerful drink, the essential drink, the sweet draft, the divine draft, the grateful liquor, the universal drink, the American drink, the amber beverage, the convivial drink, the universal thrill, king of all perfumes, the cup of happiness, the soothing draft, ambrosia of the gods, the intellectual drink, 
the aromatic draught, the salutary beverage, the good fellow drink, the drink of democracy, the drink ever glorious, wakeful and civil drink, the beverage of sobriety, a psychological necessity, the fighting man's drink, loved and favored drink, the symbol of hospitality, this rare Arabian cordial, inspirer of men of letters, the revolutionary beverage, triumphant stream of sable, grave and wholesome liquor, the drink of the intellectuals, a restorative of sparkling wit, its color is the seal of its purity, the sober and wholesome drink, lovelier than a thousand kisses, this honest and cheering beverage, a wine which no sorrow can resist, the symbol of human brotherhood, at once a pleasure and a medicine, the beverage of the friends of God, the fire which consumes our griefs, gentle panacea of domestic troubles, the autocrat of the breakfast table, the beverage of the children of God, king of the American breakfast table, soothes you softly out of dull sobriety, the cup that cheers but not inebriates, coffee which makes the politician wise, its aroma is the pleasantest in all nature, the sovereign drink of pleasure and health, the indispensable beverage of strong nations, the stream in which we wash away our sorrows, the enchanting perfume that a zephyr has brought, favored liquid which fills all my soul with delight, the delicious libation we pour on the altar of friendship, this invigorating drink which drives sad care from the heart. Evolution of a Cup of Coffee Evolution of a Cup of Coffee, showing the various steps through which the bean passes from plantation to cup. 1. Planting the seed in nursery. 2. Transplanting into rows. 3. Cultivating and pruning. 4. Picking the cherries. 5. Pulping. 6. Fermenting. 7. Washing. 8. Drying in the parchment. 9. Hulling. 10. Polishing. 11. Grading. 12. Transporting to the seaport. 13. Buying and selling for export. 14. Transshipment overseas. 15. Buying and selling at wholesale. 16. Shipment to the point of manufacture. 17. Separating. 18. Milling. 19. Mixing or blending. 20. Roasting. 21. Cooling and stoning. 22. Buying and selling at retail. 23. Grinding. 24. Making the beverage. End of prefatory material.